people going on low-carb diets may not see a rise in their cholesterol levels. How is that possible? Because weight loss by any means can drop our cholesterol. We could go on an all-Twinkie diet and lower our cholesterol if we were unable to eat the dozen daily Twinkies necessary to maintain our weight. That's why a good cocaine habit can lower cholesterol. Chemotherapy can drop cholesterol like a rock. Tuberculosis can work wonders on one's waistline. Anything that drops our weight can drop our cholesterol, but the goal isn't to fit into a skinnier casket. The reason we care about cardiovascular risk factors like cholesterol is because we care about cardiovascular risk, the health of our arteries. Well, now we have studies that have measured the impact of low-carb diets on arteries directly, and a review of all the best studies done to date found that low-carb diets impair arterial function as evidenced by a decrease in flow-mediated dilation, meaning low-carb diets effectively cripple people's arteries. And since the meta-analysis was published, another study found the same thing. Dietary pattern characterized by high protein and fat with low carbohydrate associated with poorer peripheral small artery function, again measuring blood flow into people's limbs. Peripheral circulation is great, but what about circulation in the coronary arteries that feed our heart? There's only been one study ever done measuring actual blood flow to the heart muscles of people eating low-carb diets, and this is it. Dr. Richard Fleming, an accomplished uh, nuclear cardiologist, enrolled 26 people into a comprehensive study of the effects of diet on cardiac function using the latest in nuclear imaging technology, so-called SPECT scans, enabling him to actually directly measure the blood flow within the coronary arteries. He then put them all on a healthy vegetarian diet, and a year later the scans were repeated. By that time, however, 10 of the patients had jumped ship onto the low-carb bandwagon. At first, I, I bet he was upset, but surely soon realized he had an unparalleled research opportunity dropped into his lap. Here he had extensive imaging on 10 people following a low-carb diet, and 16 following a healthy high-carb diet. What would their hearts look like at the end of the year? Uh, we can talk about risk factors all we want, but compared to the VEG group, did the coronary heart disease of the patients following the Atkins-like diets improve, worsen, or stay the same? Those sticking to the vegetarian diet showed a reversal of their heart disease as expected. Their partially clogged arteries literally got cleaned out. They had 20% less atherosclerotic plaque in their arteries at the end of the year than at the beginning. What happened to those who abandoned the treatment diet and switched over to the low-carb diet? Their condition significantly worsened. 40 to 50% more artery clogging at the end of the year. Thanks to the kind generosity of Dr. Fleming, we can actually see the changes in blood flow for ourselves. Here are some representative heart scans. The yellow, and particularly red, represent blood flow through the coronary arteries to the heart muscle. This patient went on a plant-based diet, and coronary arteries opened right up, increasing blood flow. This person, however, started out with good flow, but after a year on a low-carb diet, significantly clogged down their arterial blood flow. This is the best science to date, uh, demonstrating the threat of low-carb diets, not just measuring risk factors, but actual blood flow in people's hearts on different diets. Of course, the reason we care about cardiac blood flow is we don't want to die, and a meta-analysis was recently published that finally went ahead and measured the ultimate endpoint, death. And low-carb diets were associated with significantly higher risk of all-cause mortality, meaning low-carbers living a significantly shorter lifespan. the total antioxidant capacity of our diet may also be protective against stroke, in contradiction to all the pill studies that failed to show benefit. But what they did in this study was to take into account all antioxidants present in actual food in the diet, including thousands of compounds and doses obtained from a usual diet, not one or two in high doses in pill form. Stroke is the world's leading cause of death after heart disease. The Buildup of oxidized fat is considered the hallmark of fatty streak formation, the earliest manifestation of atherosclerotic plaques. 
Yes, the oxidation of fat can happen outside the body every time we cook it, but oxidized fats are not only formed in foods, but may also be generated during digestion, especially in stomach acid. Our stomach may be like a bioreactor for the oxidation of high-fat, cholesterol-rich foods. See, muscle foods contain large amounts of endogenous catalysts, which accelerate fat oxidation. As poultry sits in our stomach, the oxidation may build up minute by minute. See, chickens are bled of only about half their blood, and the remaining residual can be a powerful promoter of fat oxidation. So there are those in the industry advocating an additional decapitation step uh, to reduce all that oxidation. But if oxidation is the problem, antioxidants may be part of the solution. Total antioxidant capacity from diet and risk of heart attack. Well, we know antioxidant pills don't work. Uh, while extensive experimental data have revealed a central role for oxidative stress in the stiffening of our arteries, and suggested a potential role for antioxidant treatment in cardiovascular disease, experimental data has not translated into clinical benefit. Most antioxidant vitamin trials have failed to reduce heart disease and death, and may in fact even be detrimental. As a result, some have even questioned the supposed central role of oxidative stress in the disease process. Described as a critical blow to the whole free radical theory of aging, the fact that pills didn't work. But high-dose single antioxidant supplements are not a good substitute for the very complex antioxidant network of thousands of compounds in foods, present at concentrations far below those used in the pill trials. No one had ever looked at the overall effect of the complex antioxidant network in diet in relation to our leading killer, coronary heart disease, until now. The total antioxidant capacity measures in one single value the free radical reducing capacity of all antioxidants present in foods and all the synergistic effects. And in this large perspective population-based cohort study, they observed that higher total antioxidant capacity of diet was associated with lower risk of incident heart attack in a dose-response manner, meaning uh, potentially the more high antioxidant plant foods in our diet, the better.